Okay, hi everyone. I'm Melissa Green, a Technology Accessibility Training Specialist with the Faculty Resource Center's Emerging Technology and Accessibility Team. And our unit works to ensure that all technology users, including those with disabilities, have a functional and accessible technology experience with our web presence and our instructional and emerging technologies. You can find more information about our efforts on our website at accessibility.ua. Edu. A quick moment for housekeeping. I have muted everyone by default, so we won't be disrupted by latecomers. But when you want to talk, just click the microphone icon in the bottom bar to mute or unmute yourself. You can also choose to have your camera on or off. Please do mute your microphone when you're not speaking. When I'm talking or sharing my screen, please write in the chat box and let me know if you can't see or hear something. And finally, you are welcome to use that chat box throughout. I may not be watching closely while I'm talking, but I'll do my best to check in every once in a while. If I don't see your question or comment immediately, don't worry, I will come back to it at the end. So this slide includes a picture of me. I have my webcam turned off to preserve bandwidth, but I thought you might like to see who you're speaking with today. Um, I am presenting from home. I'm home with a sick pet, so I'm hoping that um, everything goes smoothly on the tech end, um, but again, my apologies if um, we have any technical problems as a result of that. During today's webinar, we'll look at creating Microsoft PowerPoint presentations that are accessible to people with disabilities. This session will cover finding and using accessible PowerPoint templates, using the accessibility checker to identify and fix potential accessibility issues, accessible design and layout of text, images, and other content, embedding captioned video, and saving presentations as accessible PDF documents. When we offer this session in the classroom, it's usually as a hands-on workshop. Since that's difficult to do in a webinar environment, I'm going to describe what I'm doing as I do it so that if you're interested in following along with the recording later, you'll be able to do so. And I will send you a link to that recording via email in the next few days. The email will include additional resources, including links to relevant Microsoft and other documentation. I'll also include some resources on accessible presentation practices. So the focus of today's session is really on the technology accessibility, how you can uh, structure and format your content using the PowerPoint software to ensure that it's accessible to all users. But there are a number of different practices you can um, implement in your presentation environment, whether that's a classroom or a meeting um, or lecture and so on, um, that can help make that presentation accessible to all. So um, again, while that's not our primary focus, I will follow up uh, with some resources to help you with that. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. So some of you have probably heard me say this before, but the most powerful weapon in your Microsoft Office accessibility arsenal is the accessibility checker. The accessibility checker tool finds accessibility issues in your Word documents, PowerPoint presentations, Excel spreadsheets, and Outlook on the web emails. The tool generates a report of issues that could make your content difficult for people with disabilities to understand. It explains why you should fix these issues and walks you through how to fix them. So we are going to use the accessibility checker to check the accessibility of a presentation that includes information about some of the traditions at the University of Alabama. If you are an Office 365 user, you'll find it very easy to open and use the accessibility checker in Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. You simply navigate to the Review tab in the ribbon and select the Check Accessibility button. If you have an older version of Word, Excel, or PowerPoint and you don't see the Check Accessibility button on the Review tab of the ribbon, you can follow these steps to open the Accessibility Checker. In the ribbon, you would go to the File tab and select Info, select the Check for Issues button, and then select Check Accessibility. And whether you initiate that check from um, the Review tab or 
from the file tab, um, the following steps are the same. So after you start the check by selecting check accessibility, the accessibility checker task pane appears next to your content and shows the inspection results. If uh, people with disabilities are unable to read content in the file, the accessibility checker classifies it as an error. So our inspection results are in the right sidebar. Let me see if I can make that a little bigger and easier to see. And they're classified in, into groups. So uh, the groups are errors, warnings, and tips. So if people with disabilities are unable to read content in the file, it will be classified as an error. Most of the errors in this particular presentation involve missing alternative text. Uh, the checker is telling us that contents on slides 7, 14, 19, and 20 are missing alt text. The accessibility checker also tells us that on slide 12, there's a table that does not have a header row. If content in the file is uh, difficult for people with disabilities to read, the accessibility checker gives a a, a warning and there's no warnings indicated in this particular file. When there's content that people with disabilities can read but that could be better organized or uh, you could present in a way that might improve that experience, the checker may offer additional tips. The tips um, indicated by the accessibility checker for this file address duplicate slide titles so I've used the title, um, The Elephant, on multiple slides, as well as the title, The Million Dollar Band, and The Rammer Jammer Cheer. Also under tips, there's a reminder to check the reading order of my slides, especially on slide 19. So my favorite thing about the accessibility checker is that it not only indicates where there's a problem and why the problem presents an accessibility barrier, it also tells you how to fix it. So for example, um, this error indicates table has no header row. So the content placeholder three on slide 12 um, has no header row. So I'm gonna select that error and it will take me to the problematic content. And then here at the bottom of the accessibility checker pane underneath the inspection results, I get an, some additional information. Uh, why do I need to fix this? And the accessibility checker tells us that table headers contain column headings that help everyone understand what's in the table and provide navigation information for assistive software. People can set a screen reader to repeat headings when they read a cell. So after telling us why this is a problem and why should we fix it, um, we are given the steps to fix it. So the checker tells us to specify a header row. We should select the table, um, which is PowerPoint's already done for us, and then click on the table tools design tab. So I'll be doing that up here in the ribbon. Then check the header row table style option. And in the table style options group, I'm selecting header row. And the visual appearance of my table changes slightly as the header row is added. And you might have noticed that that particular error was removed from the inspection results. So this accessibility checker can't catch every single accessibility issue. No automated checker can, but it is a great resource. Most of the issues that present barriers to access, including those identified by the accessibility checker, excuse me, can be prevented or fixed by following a few simple practices that we'll look at now. You can enhance the accessibility of your office content by using built-in styles and templates with fonts and colors that are easy to see. Microsoft offers a collection of templates that help you make your content accessible to everyone. And these templates use accessibility features provided by Windows and Office and have things like better color contrast, large font size, headings in logical format, and more. Um, specifically in the accessible PowerPoint templates, Microsoft has improved the reading order for slide content and given each slide a unique title wherein a user can uh, enter the title of his choice. So for example, instead of every slide reading click to add title, the accessible templates say add a slide title one, add a slide title two, and so on. 
You can find these accessible templates by searching for accessible templates on office.com or you can get to them from within the office application. I'm switching back over to our traditions PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to act as if it, I'm ready to create a new PowerPoint presentation and I'd like to use an accessible template for that. So I'm starting that process by going to the file tab in the ribbon, choosing new to open a new presentation. And then here I could search for the word accessible and the collection of online templates and I'll get quite a few results. I actually find um, these results a little overwhelming. Um, I don't know who created them. I don't know what it is that makes them accessible. There's a lot of them to go through. So what I like to do is instead explore something called the accessible template sampler. Um, you can find that just by searching for accessible sampler. And that is actually a PowerPoint that includes um, several other PowerPoints that have been put together by Microsoft. So I'm going to click on this once so we can see the uh, description of the template sampler. Unfortunately, um, we can't see it from this view, but I'll go ahead and click create and open it up. And this uh, PowerPoint actually includes a sample of popular accessible PowerPoint templates that have been optimized for use by people with visual disabilities. And I think it's a little more friendly to explore. So there's a slide with links to education related templates, technology related templates, lifestyle, and so on. So I'll go ahead and close this. You can make the content in your PowerPoint presentations easy to navigate by using an accessible template, but there are also some other steps you can take. Um, a very important step is to ensure that slide contents can be read in the order that you intend. And this is especially important for screen reader users and those who use assistive technology like a switch or a mouth stick to access and control a computer or smartphone. I'm going to mention a screen reader several times, so just to make sure we all know what that's in reference to. A screen reader is a software program that converts digital text into synthesized speech, enabling users with visual disabilities to hear content and navigate with the keyboard. Screen readers are also used by people with certain cognitive or learning disabilities or users who simply prefer audio over text or maybe learn best by hearing audio along with text. When someone who can see reads a slide, they usually read things such as text or pictures in the order that the elements appear on the slide. In contrast, a screen reader reads the elements of a slide in the order in which they were added to the slide, which might be very different from the order in which things appear visually. Reading order is also important for people who have limited or no movement in their hands and arms and use wands, sticks, or switches to access the computer. You want to make sure these users can scan or tab through all the elements on the slide in the order that you intended. So our uh, problematic and accessible PowerPoint has some issues uh, with reading order. These were caught um, by the accessibility checker. So slide 19, it uh, prompted us to check the reading order. So we'll go to that now. I'm actually going to close the accessibility checker pane. Sorry, I've got a misbehaving mouse. Okay. I think it's because I'm switching between uh, touching the screen and using the mouse. Hold on just a second. Okie doke. So to set the order in which screen readers read the slide contents, you'll use the selection pane. So on the home tab, in the drawing group, you'll select arrange. And in the arrange menu, select selection pane. And the selection pane lists the objects on the slide in reverse order. So when a screen reader reads this slide, it will read the objects listed in the selection pane from bottom to top. 
So right now, if a screen reader user were to access this slide in my PowerPoint, they would first hear the text starting with content placeholder four. So I'm clicking on that so we can see what that is. So the very first thing they would hear on arriving to this slide is uh, the text that starts with the cadence of the cheer was adapted from the Ole Miss cheer hotty totty. The next thing they would hear would be the alternative text, um, if any, that I had supplied for this picture, followed by information about the Rammer Jammer cheer. The Rammer Jammer cheer is a traditional cheer and so on. And then the very last thing they would hear is the title. And this is quite different from how a visual user would access this slide. A visual user would probably um, first see and read the title. It's at the top, it's in larger font. Um, then most um, English reading users in our country are gonna be reading from left to right. So they would read some introductory information telling us what the Rammer Jammer cheer is. Then they would get more information about the cheers cadence. Um, then finally uh, see that University of Alabama logo at the bottom. So the reading order is not what I intended. So in order to fix that, we can do that in the selection pane. We can drag and drop items to the new location. So if I wanted the title to be read first, remember it reads from the bottom up, I would click on title and drag that down to the bottom of the list. Another way in which one can do that is by using these arrows um, to move things around. So the next thing I want to be read is content placeholder two, which introduces what the Rammer Jammer Cheer is. To move that so that it's read after the title, I would select it and then use the send backward or down arrow. So now the reading order matches the visual order. Title, content placeholder two, content placeholder four, and then finally the picture. While the accessibility checker may prompt you to check the reading order of your slides as it did for me, it can't determine if the reading order is correct. Um, only a human can. I suggest that as one of the last steps before you save the final version of your PowerPoint, that you manually check the reading order of every slide. That sounds pretty tedious, but it's not as bad as you might think. So once you open the selection pane, as I have open here, it will remain open as you switch between slides in normal view. So I'm gonna switch, um, through my slides starting with slide 19 and going backwards. So there's our selection pane for slide 19, selection pane for slide 18, selection pane for slide 17, and so on. So again, I usually do this as um, almost the very last step before I publish because before then I'm still moving things around and adding and removing content. Another thing you can do to help ensure proper reading order is to use built-in slide designs. PowerPoint has built-in slide designs that contain placeholders for text, videos, pictures, and more. They also contain all the formatting, such as theme colors, fonts, and effects. To make sure that your slides are accessible, the built-in layouts are designed so that the reading order is the same for people who see and people who use technology such as screen readers. So I'm gonna add a new slide using one of the built-in slide designs. While in normal view, I'm gonna position the cursor's insertion point where I want to add the new slide. Uh, let's just keep it simple and add the new slide at the very end. So now I can right-click and select new slide or go to the insert tab in the ribbon and choose new slide. Um, no matter which way you do it, several layouts are available. With this particular theme, office theme, some of the available layouts are title slide, title and content, section header, to content, and so on. I'll select the slide layout I want. Let's do to content. And PowerPoint will automatically apply this layout to the new slide. I would go to the slide and then add um, the title and content that I want. So check out the reading order here in the selection pane on the right sidebar. Remember, screen readers read from bottom to top. Because I used a built-in slide design, the reading order is correct. It will read title first, then the content placeholder two, then content placeholder three. You aren't limited to the layouts that come with each theme. You know, perhaps you already have a college or department theme that uses layouts that are included here. That's okay, you can 
add custom slide layouts through the slide master so you don't have to manually fix the reading order for every slide. I'll include some how to's for that when I email you the recording of this session. You know, if you're thinking about quick action steps to apply um, immediately following today's webinar, that would be one. Um, find out if there is a department. Um, or college or organizational template and assess the accessibility of that. If you fix issues in the template that everyone's using, you know, that's going to increase the likelihood that the materials being produced across your unit are accessible. Another thing you can do to improve the navigability of your PowerPoint presentations is to give every slide a unique title. Uh, many assistive technology users rely on slide titles to navigate. For example, by skimming or using a screen reader, they can quickly scan through a list of slide titles and go right to the slide that they want. The accessibility checker will help identify duplicate slide titles. So I'll bring that up again just by going to review, check accessibility. Remember, I've used some duplicate slide titles here. The accessibility checker is telling me that I've used uh, the elephant, for example, multiple times starting with slide six and continuing on slide seven. Um, I'm going to navigate to slide six now. And slide six actually isn't the first place I use that title. That's just where the duplication occurs. So I actually use the elephant for the first time in slide five, then slide six, then slide seven. So in order to be accessible, each of these slides needs to have a unique title. So um, I know because I put this together that this slide really outlines the early history. So I might change the title to something like the elephant, early history, the next slide, something like later history. And this slide is really about Big Al. So um, a more descriptive title might be Big Al. The accessibility checker called our attention to the duplicate titles, but um, this is something else that I like to manually check before I publish the final version of my, my presentation. I do that by going to the view tab and selecting the outline view and reviewing um, and editing the slide titles here in the outline in the left sidebar. To me, this view just makes it a little more likely that I'll be able to see um, those duplicate titles and edit them all in one spot. Every slide does need a title. Um, some presenters don't wish to have a title visible on their slide for aesthetic reasons. Um, in that case, you can put a title on a slide, but make the title invisible using the selection pane in PowerPoint. Um, I'll do that now. I'm just going to quickly add a new slide. I'll insert a slide that uh, has a title and content. And for my content, I'm going to add a picture of the kitty I'm hanging out with today. You know, aesthetically, I kind of like this look of having um, a full screen picture, but it's not accessible because I don't have a title. Um, so I'm going to go back to my outline view. And for slide 22, add a title. In this case, I'm typing uh, Kitty Assistant because he's here helping with me with my presentation today. Um, this isn't visible. Uh, the contrast is not sufficient. We'll talk about that in just a second. But again, maybe aesthetically, I like the look of just a, a full screen image. I don't want this text to be there. I can modify that by going to uh, that selection pane I'm closing the accessibility checker. The home tab, I'm going to arrange and then selection pane. And there's a little eye icon uh, next to each element placeholder indicating its visibility. So in this case, for the title, I could click on the eye to turn off the visibility of the title. So that title is not going to be there for a sighted user, but it will be present in my outline view and it will be present for an assistive technology user. Some other changes I would need to make. Um, again, reordering things so that title is read first and so on. So every slide does need a title, but it's okay to hide that uh, using the 
selection pane. You can also systematically hide all of your slide titles by editing the slide master. And I'll send you some information about that. Another basic principle of digital accessibility is ensuring links make sense out of context by avoiding phrases like click here and more as link text. And this is especially important because screen reader users often navigate from link to link, skipping the text in between, or use a keyboard shortcut to view a list of all of the links present on the page. Turning to our PowerPoint, this slide, slide 17, presents information about the Yay Alabama school song and includes a link labeled Yay Alabama. So if you saw this link out of context, you probably wouldn't understand what it's for or what clicking it would do. Um, we can assume that it has something to do with Yay Alabama, but we don't know if clicking it will skip to a different slide, open a web page, start playing an audio or video file, open a PDF, and so on. So we need to edit this link text so it's more descriptive. To do that, we will right click on the hyperlink, choose edit link, and in the text to display field, change the hyperlink text so it's more descriptive. So right now the text currently reads, yay Alabama. Uh, this link actually leads to a YouTube video of the million dollar band playing and singing uh, yay Alabama. So I might call it something like, um, million dollar band performs yay Alabama. I also like to alert the user when uh, clicking on a link is going to open up a file like a PDF or video or audio. And that's very important for assistive technology users, but it's also just kind of a considerate thing to do. So I'll either include that information in parentheses as part of the link text, or uh, maybe preface the link with something like uh, YouTube video. Million Dollar Band performs Yay Alabama. So now someone who sees that link completely out of context knows what it is. It's a link to a YouTube video of, of the Million Dollar Band performing Yay Alabama. This slide presents information about the alma mater and also includes a link to a YouTube video of the Million Dollar Band uh, singing the alma mater. Generally speaking, it's best to avoid using the actual URL as link text and to use human readable text instead. So a more appropriate link text here, instead of the full URL, which is pretty unwieldy, particularly for a screen reader user, might be something like Million Dollar Band Sings Alma Mater. So avoid using the text of the link, uh, the URL, itself as hyperlink text, unless it's relevant. So let's say you were, I don't know, recording meeting minutes where there was a debate or a discussion about um, what the address of a new web page should be. In that case, it would be relevant. Um, you know, the URL was a point of discussion. All visual content in your Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, Outlook emails, and PowerPoint presentations should have alt text. And this includes pictures, clip art, smart art graphics, shapes, groups, charts, embedded objects, ink, and videos, anything visual. Alternative text or alt text helps users understand what's important in images and other visuals. Screen readers speak the alternative text in place of images, allowing the content and the function of the image to be accessible to those with visual or certain cognitive disabilities. Also, um, if the content is provided online, that alt text will be displayed in place of the image in browsers if the image file isn't loaded. Um, or if the user has chosen not to view images. And for online content, that can also be read by search engines. Again, um, you might hear the thunder in the background. I am presenting from home, so my apologies for uh, any interruptions related to that.
So all of the images in my terrible presentation are lacking alternative text, um, including our photograph of Big Al, which I'm returning to now. To add alt text to an image in PowerPoint, you can right click the image, choose format picture, select layout and properties, and select alt text. You'll then need to enter a description of the image's content or function in the description field, not the title field. Putting alt text in the description field will provide the best experience with most major screen readers. Content in the description field is converted to alt text when a PDF is exported from PowerPoint. So again, put that alt text, put that description of the image's content and function in the description field. Alt text is highly contextual. Um, in some instances, the function of this image might be purely decorative. If a mascot costume sales representative were delivering a presentation that included a slide with this image, in their alt text, they might describe um, the features that would lead someone to purchase this costume. So the plushness of the fur or the size of the head or um, the fact that it has openings for sight and ventilation. Um, in the context of my presentation, in order to convey to the reader that Big Al is a costumed mascot and not a live elephant, I would probably describe the image as something like um, a costumed elephant mascot wearing a red, sorry, crimson football jersey with the letter A on it. So alt text is highly contextual um, depending on what the purpose of including the image is. You might choose to write that alt text in a different way. The way that alt text works with charts is a similar process. So you can right click on the chart, select uh, format chart area, select size and properties, and then select alt text and provide that description in the description field. This chart is actually so terrible that it's difficult to write a meaningful description for it. Um, it's, I completely made up the little bit of information it contains, but I would probably go with something like pie chart depicting number of million dollar band members who play clarinet, trombone, trumpet, and flute. Uh, besides the missing alt text, I'm interested to see if anyone else spots other ways in which this chart might present accessibility barriers. Feel free to, to throw out some ideas in the chat. I made it pretty bad on purpose, so you won't hurt my feelings. Adding alt text to a table is a similar approach. Again, right clicking on the table and choosing, in this case, format shape, then size and properties, then alt text, and providing a description in the description field. And yeah, I've noticed that in the chat, Jackie has indicated color distinction is not great for colorblind users. Uh, we'll talk about this in a second, but I've used color alone to convey meaning. It's hard to tell the difference between some of the colors. Um, my font is pretty small. The color contrasts with the font and background is not great. Um, there's no sense of the numbers involved, so is this all of this year's million dollar band members or all of the million dollar band members throughout history um, and so on. So there are several different issues here that we could uh, improve to enhance the accessibility. Sometimes an image is purely decorative and there's nothing important to say about it. In that case, you can tell the screen reader to skip the image. And you would do that by opening the alt text dialog as we have done before. So I'm selecting the University of Alabama logo, choosing format picture, choosing layout and properties, or size and properties, and in the description field, here's where I need to indicate um, the alt text. So all images need alt text, um, even if the image is purely decorative. In this case, we would want to tell the screen reader to skip the image. And one of the ways that we can do this is by typing in two 
double quotes with no space between them. So quote, quote. So that's actually a single set of double quotes, two quotation marks with no space in between them, quote, quote. Now the screen reader will ignore this picture. In a PDF document, such images can be tagged as artifacts. Final example um, of images in PowerPoint. To ensure your presentations are accessible, you should also avoid using text in images wherever possible. This slide includes an image of text, in this case, the Alabama Crimson Tides 2018 schedule. Um, as is, this content would be completely unavailable to a screen reader user or to your computer search tool. To make it more accessible, we should repeat the text in this image. So in this case, the text reads Alabama Crimson Tide 2018 schedule is then followed by the date of each game um, and the information about the opponent and where the game is played. We would repeat that information as alt text would be one approach. Another approach would be to restructure this slide um, so that we were providing the information as text itself or maybe provide the information in an accessible data table um, with the picture next to it. So there's several different ways you can do it. The, the underlying principle though is that text in images is inaccessible and you should avoid using text in images as the sole means of conveying information. Another impactful practice is ensuring that color is not the only means of conveying important information. And this is primarily to ensure your content is accessible to people who have color vision deficiency, sometimes called color blindness, but it's also a principle of universal design for learning. Uh, by using more than just color to convey information, you're providing multiple means of representation. To find instances of color coding, you can visually scan your presentation um, to make sure that people who are blind or have low vision or have color vision deficiency won't miss out on the meaning conveyed by particular colors. There is an instance in my presentation where color alone is used to convey meaning. This slide lists notable halftime shows with shows including signature songs indicated in red font. Um, another way to present this information might be adding the text uh, signature song instead of or in addition to the color, uh, reformatting the content as two separate lists, maybe one for shows with signature songs and one for shows without, or reformatting the content as an accessible data table with a column that includes signature song information. So it's okay to use color, but you don't wanna use color alone. Um, you need to indicate that um, in some other format along with the color. You also want to be sure to use sufficient contrast between background and foreground colors. If your slides have a high level of contrast between text and background, more people can see and use the content. And yes, that does include people with visual disabilities, but also people accessing the content on a screen in bright sunlight or trying to see a projected slide from the back of a large meeting room or lecture hall. One way to ensure you're using sufficient contrast in PowerPoint is to use one of the accessible templates, which have been designed to ensure there is sufficient contrast between text and background. Uh, the accessibility checker will look for insufficient color contrast. It will check the text on your slides against the page color, highlights, text box fills, and so on. However, it's a good idea to also check this manually, particularly when you're setting up a template. Uh, this title slide includes some text that's particularly hard to read due to insufficient contrast. I identify this by visually scanning my slides, but there are also some tools to help, particularly when it may not be as evident that the contrast is not sufficient. There are several tools you can use to check for sufficient contrast. One of my favorites is the WebAIM Color Contrast Checker which not only lets you check to see if your color choices meet contrast ratios specified by 
web content accessibility guidelines, uh, but also helps you pick color combinations that provide sufficient contrast. You enter the hexadecimal codes for the background and foreground colors. And if your color combination fails to pass the test, you can adjust the lightness slider to modify the colors by slight degrees until you get a result that has sufficient contrast. Another one our team likes is Paciello Group's Color Contrast Analyzer, which works on the web and with documents and images. You can enter hex codes to check or use an eyedropper tool similar to uh, what you find in image editing software like Photoshop to click on and select colors to check. There's also a very low tech way to check to see if color contrast is sufficient and that's to print the content in question in grayscale. That can give you a good idea um, whether or not the contrast is going to be accessible. Just a few additional tips before we finish up by talking about how to save PowerPoint presentations as accessible PDFs. When including tables in your PowerPoint presentation, use a simple table structure. Screen readers keep track of their location in a table by counting table cells. If a table is nested within another table, or if a cell is merged or split, the screen reader loses count and can't provide helpful information about the table after that point. Blank cells in a table could also mislead someone using a screen reader into thinking that there's nothing more in the table. So it's best when possible to avoid split cells, merged cells, nested tables, and completely blank rows and columns. You can also use the accessibility checker to help identify and fix problematic table structure. You can enhance accessibility when you're including tables in your PowerPoint by specifying column header information. Screen readers use header information to identify rows and columns. We looked at how to do this when we talked about how the accessibility checker worked. But just as a reminder, to indicate that your table has column headings, you go to the design tab, table style options, and select the header row checkbox. Use a larger font size, 18 point or larger, with sans serif fonts and sufficient white space. People who have dyslexia sometimes describe seeing text merge or distort, especially when text is crowded. Smaller or crowded text is also problematic for users with low vision. And again, back of a room, large lecture hall, um, and so on. You can reduce the reading load for everyone by using a larger font size, familiar sans serif fonts like Arial or Calibri, and including ample white space between sentences and paragraphs. To enhance the accessibility of your content, you should also avoid using all capital letters and excessive italics or underlines. Make sure any media embedded in or linked to from your PowerPoint is accessible. In order to ensure your audio and video content is accessible, you need to provide captions, transcripts, and when necessary, audio descriptions. I'm not gonna go into great detail about this because support for adding and playing back caption files varies widely across versions of PowerPoint, but I will provide information about that in the follow-up email. The Emerging Technology and Accessibility team can help with captioning. We can provide guidance on how to search for captioned videos and how to use the captioning and transcribing features in most players, platforms, and lecture capture systems. Our area also administers grants to caption or transcribed UA-owned video and audio that will be shared on public or campus-wide websites. You can find information about that on our website at accessibility.ua.edu. Let's move on to talking about how to save PowerPoint presentations as accessible PDFs. The first step in creating an accessible PDF from a Microsoft PowerPoint presentation is to ensure that the original PowerPoint file is accessible. The accessibility of the PDF depends on the accessibility of the source file. Creating a source file that's accessible from the start or correcting the accessibility issues in the source file is much easier than fixing the resulting PDF. 
plus any error, errors you fix in the source file only have to be fixed once. So I actually uh, corrected the accessibility errors in this PowerPoint and saved it as a PDF. Let me find that now. Just one moment. Okay, so I corrected the accessibility errors in our PowerPoint and saved it as a PDF. Um, on my screen now is that PDF with the tags panel open in the left sidebar. So although there's a bit more to it than this, when people talk about accessible PDF files, they're usually referring to PDF files that have tags. Tags are the basis of an accessible PDF file. They indicate the structure of the document communicate the order in which the item should be read and determine exactly which items will be read. When creating a PDF from a Microsoft PowerPoint presentation, you want to do so in a way that preserves the accessibility of the source file and includes these tags. So this is the PowerPoint presentation we've been looking at, but with the accessibility errors uh, corrected. We're gonna save it as a PDF now. So if you have Adobe Acrobat on your computer, you'll want to use the PDF Maker to create PDFs for Microsoft Office files. When the PDF Maker add-in is enabled, a tab labeled Acrobat will appear in the ribbon alongside other tabs like Home, Insert, Design, and so on. And this is what you want to use when generating a PDF document from your source file. I'm selecting that Acrobat tab now. When you click on the tab, it shows you all of the options available within the PDF Maker. I'm selecting the Preferences button these are the settings that are going to be used to generate the PDF file. And there's a lot of options here, um, even more under advanced settings. I'm not going to go into any more detail about this, except to point out this checkbox right here. Enable accessibility and reflow with tagged Adobe PDF. You want this to be checked. Uh, once you've done that, you can click OK, and that now defines the preferences for how the PDF file is going to be created. Um, this is not something that you should have to do each time you create a PDF. It is something as an action step to check um, if you do have this PDF Maker add-in enabled. Uh, make sure that the Enable Accessibility and Reflow with Tagged PDF option is checked. And then click OK. To actually make the PDF file, I'm going to click on the Create PDF button. And if you don't have uh, the PDF Maker add-in installed on your machine, don't worry. Um, using this add-in add typically yields the most accessible results, but there are other ways to create PDFs from Office documents. Let me save this one really quick. So I'm just gonna put it on my desktop as traditions after. Okay, see you later, Clay. So this is the PDF that I just generated out of PowerPoint. I mentioned that if you don't have that add-in, uh, don't worry, there are some other ways that you can generate an accessible PDF. One of those is by going to File, Save as Adobe PDF. Another is by going to File, Save as, and choosing PDF as the file type. If you do that, you'll want to go to more options and then options and make sure that document structure tags for accessibility is checked. Again, you shouldn't have to do this every single time and it should be enabled by default, but that's something just to check on your machine. So whether you're clicking on the Create PDF button in the ribbon or going to File, Save as Adobe PDF, or going to File, Save as PDF, um, all of those enable you to output a PowerPoint presentation as a PDF that has tags. What you do not want to do is go to File and then choose Print. Um, when you print as PDF, 
or even print as Adobe PDF. Those tags and other important accessibility information may not be transferred over to the resulting, resulting PDF. So um, avoid print PDF. And this is true across um, Office, not just PowerPoint, but also Word, Excel, and so on. I'm going to open up that PDF that I created. Once you've created a PDF, there's typically a few touch-ups that need to be done to make it fully accessible. I'm not going to outline all of those. I'll send you some information about that. And if you'd like to learn more, we are offering PDF workshops and webinars later this month. One thing I will point out is that Acrobat has two built-in tools to help you create accessible PDFs, the Accessibility Checker and the Make Accessible Action. I'm going to go to Tools accessibility. I have already added the accessibility tools to my install of Acrobat. If this didn't show up in the list, you can search for the tool here by searching for accessibility and then adding that to your list of tools. I'm going to go to accessibility. The full check feature in Acrobat checks a PDF for many of the characteristics of accessible PDFs. You can choose which problems to look for and how you want the results reported. And this is the tool that I would use in today's scenario where I've taken steps to ensure that my source file is accessible and I just need to do some light touching up after saving from that accessible source file. The other option is the accessible action wizard, make accessible action. You access that through the action wizard, choosing make accessible from the actions list. And this action wizard walks you through the steps required to make a PDF accessible. It prompts you to address accessibility issues such as missing document description or title. It looks for common elements that need further action like scanned text, form fields, tables, images. Uh, this is what I would use if I was working to remediate an inaccessible document for which I did not have the source file, or if there were uh, quite a few accessibility issues that needed to be addressed. So in conclusion, uh, the university is committed to providing technology users, including those with disabilities, a functional and accessible technology experience with our web presence and our instructional and emerging technologies. We create accessibility and disability through our design choices. Let's create accessibility, applying uh, the knowledge and skills through you, that you uh, hopefully have gained through today's session. We are here to help. Visit us at accessibility.ua.edu. Um, you can also reach out to us at accessibility at ua.edu. Um, feel free to contact me directly as well. That's all I have. Um, we do have a few minutes, so if you have questions or thoughts to share, please feel free to unmute your mic and share them now or type them in the chat box. I will stop the recording.